in England and went to school there, went to university there. And if you want to know something of the background in medicine at that time in England, it may be of interest because there was an emphasis on male admissions to medical school. So, for example, in my graduating class, there were 35 men and four women who graduated at the same time. And the opportunities for women following graduation were limited to certain specialties. So I could have been a family physician, I could have been an anesthetist, or I could have been a psychiatrist, and all the other areas were primarily staffed by men. So I decided after two years in residency in England, I decided I wanted to do something different. So I, um, I had a Canadian grandmother, which is sort of unusual because my grandfather, who was Irish, had joined the British Army like so many other Irishmen at the time. And he was garrisoned in Halifax in the 1870s. And he met my grandmother and took her back to, uh, to England, actually. So this grandmother came from Hackett's Cove in, uh, outside Halifax. So I always had this idea that maybe I'd like to come to Canada. So when I decided that maybe I'd try something on the other side of the Atlantic, I, um, I went to my professor and I said, I'd like to go to North America. And he said, well, I know people in Montreal and in Toronto. And he said, I, I don't think there's much to choose between them academically, but I think you'll have a better time in Montreal. Really quite something. So he knew Dr. Alan Ross, who was the chief of pediatrics in Montreal at that time. So he wrote to him, and lo and behold, I got a residency position. And so you, my question is, you'd already chosen your speciality as pediatrics. You knew what you wanted to do. Well, I did, after I got my degree, I did two years in England. The first was the compulsory six months medicine, six months surgery, and then I did a year of pediatrics. And so it was after that year in pediatrics that I applied to come to Montreal. Okay, so your career path was set. Yeah. You had a job to come to, uh, you chose a city. Uh, what happened then? Well, Montreal was a breath of fresh air, and Alan Ross was a wonderful chief. He, he took people on their merits. It wasn't a question of you know, whether you'd been to the right schools, whether you spoke with the right accent, as it was often in England. It was on your merits, so if you did a good job, you got credit for it. So it was, um, it was just really a very good, start to my pediatric career. Um, so, after about six months, I met my husband here, which often happens, and he was an orthopedic trainee. So, at the end of one year, we got married. So then, I was able to move out of the residence because all the, all the residents who were not married lived in that building on the corner of, um, of Dorchester, René Levesque, and Atwater. There's the building that still exists with the pillars. That's right, and, it, it, and that, that's it's kind of interesting that you say you were a doctor living there because um, everybody calls it the nurse's home. No, it wasn't the nurse's home. No, but it seems to be, and it's that's how they refer to it. And I read somewhere that it was where the doctor stayed. Well, so. It was, so maybe at a certain point it did house nurses too, but it was quite interesting because I've always heard it, so you've in fact uh, um, qualified that yeah. or explained it because I've heard yeah. there were doctors there and everybody said, no, 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 it was the nurses. No, it was not, not when I was there in 1960. So we had men on two, one and a half floors and women on half a floor because that was the numbers that we had of male and female. And, um, and we had our lounge down on, on, on the lower floor. And, and a kitchen we our, or, or well, a every, cafeteria? Every, no, every wing had a little kitchen so we could make ourselves super simple little meals. But we, there was a cafeteria 
in the hospital. We got our we got our meals, we got our uniforms, and I was paid eighty five dollars a month when I first started. But I had a uniform and I had meals and I had accommodation. So that was included in your salary. Uh, that was in, yes. That it was, was included. included. So you were a resident, um, and you you this was your remuneration, which included yeah. a place to live. But you could only be single at the time. No married uh, residents are allowed. No, only if you only if you were on call. You had we had these on call rooms. So they were always housed in that building too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, so once I married, I moved out, and I I think we got an extra fifty dollars for living out. Um, and so our first our first apartment we rented, and we bought the furniture lock, stock, and barrel from another resident who was going back to the islands. So we paid him four hundred dollars for all his furniture for a four and a half apartment, which was up on Plamondon, Victoria. Oh, that was quite a journey. It was quite time. a journey, but it was a good deal in terms of the furnishings. And did you? Uh, how many buses did you have to take to, to get two. there? Two. Oh, only two buses. Two buses yeah. Oh, so not too bad. Not too bad. Do you remember the route? One twenty-four, I think, was one of them. I oh. believe. Okay. And then there were those buses that come into NDG area, so we could come that way. And then after a year, we moved into Weirdale Place, oh. across from the children's. Uh, Weirdale Place or Weirdale Park? Weirdale Park. Weirdale Park. Just the, the just little oasis behind the church. Exactly. Oh, I love that area. Yeah, well, that was great. That was yeah. that, that was so close, so convenient. So I could just by this time I had one child and expecting another one. So it was very convenient if there was any you know, problem that arose, I could sort of dash across and settle everything down and then go back to work.